Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Robin Knowles. Uh, I've uh, been invited by Aniko to chair the Northern Ireland Showcase event, Northern Ireland's collaborative efforts to address the grand challenges. Great topic for today. And we have some great speakers this afternoon, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, to get us underway, we're going to receive a, a high column. Yes, do, do use the chat on the right hand side there uh, to ask questions, comment on, on the uh, speeches that we're hearing today. To get us on today, to give us a welcome and overview of those grand challenges, I'm going to invite up Dennis Murphy, who's CEO of Aniko um, and chairman, uh, a company he co-founded in 2004. Prior to joining Aniko, Dennis was chairman of Mobile Cohesion, a company he co-founded after leaving Open Wave in 2002. And while at Mobile Cohesion, I'm sure he's famous in Northern Ireland for this, he raised $20 million in venture capital and successfully exited the company in early 2009. So I'm just going to invite Dennis up to join me. Dennis, please come along and join me. I hope the weather in Northern Ireland is uh, as nice as it is where I am. Yes, it's an absolutely fabulous day. So let me see, can I get my um, presentation up here? Far away. Um, there we go, nearly. So how do you I just so you are you on PowerPoint? Yes. I think if you open your PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. Probably on the there you go. How, and how... back to the start, is it? Yes, indeed. Super. The floor is yours, sir. Cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, to our flagship event. We're delighted you could all uh, come and join us today. Uh, we have a very exciting program for you all, and uh, we uh, are really looking forward to telling you about some of the really interesting things that are happening here around uh, these technologies in Northern Ireland. So, well, first of all, I'd like to say that we're delighted to be uh, Digital Leaders Ambassadors for Northern Ireland, uh, simply because of the focus of Digital Leaders. Digital Leaders highlights the importance of good leadership in digital transformation, highlights the digital challenges that we face, and raises the profile of digital solutions that help to, to solve these challenges. So it's, uh, it's something that really resonates with us. Um, so in, in looking at the week and uh, looking for an appropriate theme, what we've actually uh, chosen is transformation, but transformation that's driven by climate cr uh, crisis. And then looking at the, the grand challenges that are part of the industrial strategy that will, will drive transformation across the economy. Uh, and ECO's goal is to make a difference locally and to pioneer a regional collaboration model to address these challenges. And we're particularly proud to showcase how Northern Ireland's universities, businesses and public sector are cooperating to deliver extraordinary new technologies that will bring huge environmental, societal and economic benefit to Northern Ireland and the world over the next decade. Um, just a little bit about Aneco. Um, we're a data optimization company and we are increasingly delivering projects that have environmental and societal benefit. Uh, it's uh, very much part of our, our culture and it's, it's, um, it's, it's really the, the way we see uh, uh, developing the company. Uh, and to that end, we had a very excellent uh, keynote lecture uh, from one of our major customers, uh, Alistair Jinx at NI Water, who outlined their strategy for ad addressing the climate emergency. And Colm Hayden, our CTO, will talk about how Aneco's data optimization services helped Northern Ireland in that journey in the AI and data section uh, of the session today. Um, recently here in Northern Ireland, um, we've uh, launched a new industrial strategy. It's called the 10X Economy, and it's an economic vision for a decade of innovation here in Northern Ireland. Uh, it sets out to transform the Northern Ireland economy 
and it's based around three pillars, innovation, led growth, inclusive growth, and green growth. Um, I think, um, you know, if you look around the world, um, there, are, there are major issues, um, and it's been really highlighted during the, the pandemic. The rich have gotten richer, and there's a huge portion of uh, society that, that are simply getting poorer. So any future model around growth has got to address that income disparity and uh, be much more inclusive. And the, uh, the focus here in Northern Ireland then is using a sort of core competency-based innovation model to deliver a 10 times better economy for the benefit of all our people. Now, over, over the last period of time, we've made huge progress here. Um, like for instance, Northern Ireland is one of the best places in the UK to grow a company from zero to a, a million pounds in revenue. And that's because there is a, a, a tremendous ecosystem here that uh, fosters that early entrepreneurship and um, you know, accelerates people to that um, million pound goal. And really our hope for the next uh, decade is that uh, we won't be just talking about million pound revenue companies, but tens and, and potentially hundreds of millions of, 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 of pounds revenue companies, because that's what we need to transform the economy here. Uh, I, 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 I really believe that um, a, a great society is built around great companies. And that's, that's what we're trying to grow here in Northern Ireland. Uh, just then to move on to the grand challenges that we're using as a sort of framework for the session today. The UK industrial strategy sets out uh, uh, initial grand challenges that will put us at the forefront of the industries of the future and ensuring that we take advantage of ma major global changes, particularly around climate change that will improve people's lives and improve productivity. And these grand challenges are giving an additional urgency because there is a new net zero target of 100% reduction by 2050, which means that we will have to really transform the economy at an accelerated rate if we are to achieve uh, this sort of economic, uh, uh, or, or the, the, this sort of net zero target. So the four grand challenges then, to call them out, uh, these are clean growth, age, aging society, the future of mobility, and artificial intelligence. And we're really, really lucky to have a, a rock star panel of speakers in all these areas, highlighting the very best of what's happening here in Northern Ireland. Uh, let's start with clean growth. Uh, the move to cleaner economic growth through low carbon technologies and the efficient use of, uh, of resources is one of the greatest industrial opportunities of our time. Whole new industries will be created and existing industries transformed as we move towards a low carbon, more resource efficient economy. Uh, Professor John Barry of Queen's will question growth itself as an appropriate objective for our economy in our climate changed, carbon constrained world. There is a growing body of economic uh, theory uh, that has a similar sort of theme. Uh, I, I, I recently read um, Kate Rayworth's uh, Donut Economics, where she highlights that economic growth has to be uh, has to be balanced with, with societal and ecological benefit. And that's very much the, the school, if, uh, 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 if John would agree with me, that uh, John comes from. And we look forward to, uh, to his talk on clean growth. We then move on to aging society. Um, the UK population is aging, as it is across the industrial world. Aging populations will create new demands for technologies, products and services, including new care technologies. And again, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Charlotte Neville with us, again from Queen's, 
who will talk about, and I hope I don't get tongue twisted during this, the Northern Ireland cohort of the Longitudinal Study of Aging, or NICOLA. Uh, and this is the first large scale study of aging in Northern Ireland. And she will share some of the insights from that study. And then uh, we will have um, Paul Moorhead, who is a founder of Cradle, a Belfast based age tech company, who will outline how new technologies are helping people to remain independent longer by enabling better communication with family and healthcare providers. And I, and I think we all saw during COVID the necessity of um, uh, technology like this. Like for instance, I, I didn't see my own mother for, for over a year in person. So having technologies like this was just uh, uh, fundamental in, in, in terms of uh, staying in touch and making sure that uh, she was properly look, uh, looked after. And uh, then the future of mo mobility, which is another really interesting area where there is a lot of innovation happening here in Northern Ireland. We are on the cusp of profound change in how people move goods and services around their towns, cities and countrysides. This is driven by extraordinary, extraordinary innovation in engineering, technology and business models. The past year was a pivotal one with uh, many important achievements across the disruptive dimensions of mobility, including autonomous driving, connectivity, shared mobility and electrification. And again, we're very lucky to have Juliana Early, uh, also from Queens, to discuss emerging battery versus high, the, the emerging battery versus hydrogen dilemma and the role of digital technologies uh, in shaping our mobility solutions. And again, uh, in, in Alistair Jinx's talk yesterday, he talked about how NI Water are producing uh, green hydrogen. Uh, so some really good innovation, not just from the academic world, but also uh, commercially happening here in Northern Ireland and doing some really interesting works with uh, Right Bus. And then the final section will cover AI and data. <clears throat> AI and data can be seen as like totally new industries, but they're also transforming the business models across many sectors as vast data sets are deployed to identify better ways of, uh, of doing complex tasks. Embedding AI across industries will create thousands of good quality jobs and drive economic growth. Colm Hayden will present the opportunities for transforming water management by applying the benefits of artificial intelligence. And then Sean McCauley from Northern Ireland Water will explain how they are delivering value to their customers and to the environment through smarter uh, data management. So that's really the structure of our session today. And um, uh, I would like again to thank you all for joining. And uh, I know you will enjoy uh, a really good set of talks today around the grand challenges. So Robin, back to you. Dennis, a fantastic, fantastic summary of the start uh, at the start, and also a great review of all our, our upcoming speakers. So uh, let's crack on with the program. Great to have you with us, Dennis. Um, so our first speaker is uh, talking to us about clean growth, green growth, or beyond growth. Um, there's much talk of the need for clean and green growth in the face of the planetary crisis. And as part of a new economic strategy as we seek to build back better after the pandemic, uh, while there's much merit in these efforts, perhaps it's also time to question growth itself as an appropriate objective for the economy in our climate change and carbon constrained world. So a great topic, really looking forward to this one. And to give the talk, we have Professor John Barry of Queen's University, Belfast. Um, John is a father, a recovering politician, and professor of green political economy and co-director of the Centre for Sustainability, Equality and Climate Action at Queen's University, Belfast. He's also co-chair of the Belfast Climate Commission. And John, 
uh, shared with me. He says, what keeps him awake at night is the life opportunities and future well-being of his children in this age of planetary crisis, which does sound serious, John. So I'm going to invite John to come up and join me. Really looking forward to this talk. We were talking, in fact, we were talking about COP26 in Glasgow yesterday, which I suspect John will be going to. Um, That's wonderful. Thank you, Robin, and, and, and thank you, uh, Dennis, and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> it's rather fitting that I'm going to be talking to you at the start of today's session, because what I'm going to be um, talking about is a kind of a macro level uh, changes in the structure of our economy based upon the biophysical realities, what's happening to this planet, and suggests that uh, it is time indeed for us to start thinking at a macroeconomic level. And it's important to understand that that's what I'm focusing on at the macroeconomic level, that we need to seriously start considering moving beyond particularly GDP measured economic growth. And the reasons I say that are this image kind of captures it. Um, is that the biophysical reality is we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. With the exception of solar radiation and the bioregenerative capacity of natural resources, uh, the earth is not growing. And yet our uh, metabolism as a subsystem, which is the human economy, um, is based upon infinite growth, particularly under our modern political economy of, of capitalism, competitiveness and globalization. And I'm here to tell you that from a scientific point of view, that's simply moonshine. We cannot continue uh, if we in particular want a sustainable future in the decades ahead, or if indeed we have any concern, whether it's from a, a moral point of view or purely strategic point of view of lifting the majority of the human family out of poverty. So the argument I'm gonna present is that in the 21st century, our economies at the macro level, and by this I also mean our economies in what I would say is the overdeveloped world in Europe, Australasia, and Japan, and North America, our economies have grown enough. Um, nothing in nature grows forever. And I would say that our economies in the minority world, where maybe 20% of the human family actually live, we need to move beyond growth to talk about quality of life and actually decoupling um, resource use and energy use, not from production, which is the green growth strategy, which I would applaud as a step in the right direction, but actually to decouple human flourishing and well-being as the new goals for the 21st century for our economies in the global north. And I do want to raise the possibility, even there in Dennis's um, overview, or indeed if you look at the new minister Paul Frew in the economy and the new vision for the Northern Ireland economy, it's all based around growth. And many of us simply assume that growth is good and it does have a positive view, you know, it connotes maturation, development and so on. But actually, if you think seriously, why does the economy necessarily have to grow uh, all the time? Um, particularly given that for most ordinary people, this may be different from policymakers and chief executives, most ordinary people want jobs, they want uh, public services, uh, they want decent schools. And so I'll open up your minds perhaps to the possibility, what if we can have those things but without growth? In other words, to decouple growth from good things that we want, or indeed to see that growth is a means to an end. I suppose uh, that's probably the biggest take home message from my talk, if you fall asleep listening to my Southern dulcet of tones, growth is not an end in itself, but why is it that we see public policy, business discussion, the academic discussion of business and economics are all uncomplicatedly, and I would say uncritically accepting that somehow we need a growing economy. Particularly in part because as far as I can make out, quite a lot of our economic growth is based upon ever increasing consumption. Uh, and there is an argument to say that actually quite a lot of our consumption in the overdeveloped world is what I would call defensive consumption. Uh, it's not consumption that's adding enormously to the quality of our lives. Don't get me wrong, at a very low level uh, of economic development and in poverty, growth is good, consumption is good. But how many pairs of shoes do we need? Uh, how many more electronic devices um, do we need? So I'm going to question consumption and consumerism, which I see as inextricably linked with this kind of default, uncritical exception or a, 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 a accepting of the idea that somehow growth is necessary. 
So this is a summary of my life's work for the past 30 years as a heterodox uh, economist, but it's funny, you stick around long enough, a bit like a stopped clock, you tell the right time twice a day. Uh, ideas of post-growth are now being accepted and at least being discussed by the OECD, the IMF, uh, even under the, the last conservative Liberal Democrat government in the UK, there was talk about you know, moving to well-being indicators and so on. And you see actually that well-being agenda being developed in New Zealand and Scotland and in Iceland, all curiously enough led by women. Maybe there's a connection there. I can see four reasons of which I'm not going to discuss all of them. You'd be delighted to know. Uh, I can see from sustainability point of view, as I mentioned earlier, the biophysical realities of a non-growing planet is how can the, a subsystem of a non-growing larger system infinitely grow? It's rather like a balloon in a, in a fixed box. At some point, the balloon is going to burst. I'll also make uh, some comment that actually more economic growth, particularly in our overdeveloped societies, actually requires inequality and actually increases rather than decreases inequality. So if you're concerned about lowering levels of inequality, well, why not go straight to redistribution as opposed to more economic growth that then trickles down to those on lower income? I'll talk about how particularly in countries in Europe and North America, at least for the past 20 years or so, we have the evidence from social psychology and, and, and social science that more growth isn't making us any happier on average or isn't adding uh, appreciably to human flourishing on average. Of course, there are still levels of inequality and poverty uh, and so on within our societies, which again, uh, would go back to the idea that maybe it's redistribution we need to be engaging in, uh, socializing consumption, as in more public forms of consumption, you know, public transportation, libraries and so on, as opposed to private car, automobiles, or indeed private consumption. And it has been my view for quite some time that the more our economy is oriented, oriented towards economic growth, it can actually have corrosive effects on our democratic systems. And I take my inspiration from this chap here, Herman Daly, who's kind of the, the godfather or the grandfather of the post-growth uh, political economy perspective going back over 50 years. There's a point beyond which more economic growth actually becomes uneconomic, um, that actually it adds more costs than it does provide benefits. And we need also to be aware that growth, as is conventionally understood in neoclassical economics and public policy, and most business schools, how they teach business cycles, or indeed how most businesses operate, it's a quantitative measurement as opposed to more qualitative ideas of development or indeed of human flourishing. So again, to repeat what I said at the beginning, what I'm offering here is a macro level analysis of the economy. And this is compatible, and this is the, the dominant economic uh, idea that um, Dennis had mentioned at the start by a wonderful economist, uh, Kate Rayworth, and I'd encourage you all to watch one of our podcasts or indeed read our very accessible book. And the idea is that so long as the overall economy isn't growing, in other words, it's within the sustainable limits, of resource use and, and pollution absorption by natural systems. Within that economy, we can have different bits of, this, of, of the economy growing and declining and so on. And this is the idea of the, uh, the donut that we have this macro level that doesn't grow, but we also need a social floor below which then nobody uh, falls below. And again, to reiterate, the idea here is that we need to start thinking growth not as an end in itself, but actually as a means to an end. Because provocatively put, growth for its own sake is the ideology of the cancer cell. That's what cancer is. It's growth of, uh, you know, of, of, of within an organism that's now surpassed the, the safe thresholds that's no longer healthy for the organism. This is uh, one of the ways of understanding this donut idea. So the sweet spot is below the ecological ceiling where we're, we're not transgressing climate change as we already are, it's already in the red. We're certainly going through the sixth great mass extinction event uh, at eight, eight o'clock there, the biodiversity loss crisis. These are the overall macro level. And this is a planetary scale, but you can disaggregate it down to more uh, regional bases. And then of course you got the social foundation. So the sweet spot is, is in between um, the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. So it's a very different model and paradigm of understanding the economy. It's a, it, it's a paradigm that's fit for the 21st century in the world that's now coming into being, that sometimes we call the Anthropocene, the age of human activity, and certainly our climate change world, uh, and indeed the, the, the importance of seeing that we need to move away from, 
on carbon in the current context. Now, many of you are in business and you'll be familiar with the concept of GDP, gross domestic product, which is the most uh, common understanding of economic growth. That's simply the total expenditure of all goods and services within the country. So what does that include? Well, good things, products and services, education. From personal experience, I wouldn't recommend doing one and two uh, together. I think if you value your head, uh, speaking as a, a student, I don't do that anymore. Sure, I don't, Juliana. But what also adds to GDP is actually things that we would see negatively. Divorce is good for economic growth because ching ching, now we need two houses. Ching ching, maybe the child or children now needs two sets of toys. Ching ching, now we need maybe two cars or three cars where one or two um, um, were used before. Never mind then the associated legal costs and so on. In other words, GDP is amoral, it doesn't care. Um, where the increase in the consumption and production of goods and services come from. Strangely enough, there are aspects of even pollution incidents that can add to GDP. And sadly, wars are also extremely good for GDP. You can actually track particularly economies like the US and see every time there's a war, it has a, it has a bounce in the American economy, in part because of the deal with the structure of the US economy, you know, that infamous, famous military industrial prison complex that given the amount of the US economy that's connected into the military whenever there's a war, there's also uh, an, an, an economic bounce. And I'm posing, well, this is not a really good measure, I don't think, of social progress because it's so amoral and it's blind to what many of us, I'm assuming, would see as rather negative, if not dubious, forms of activity. But what's not included in GDP? Well, the unpaid work largely of women in terms of the work that goes on in the home, the caring responsibilities for children or our elderly who aren't in the formal care system, that doesn't get included in GDP. When was the last time you turned on BBC Radio Ulster and when you had the economics correspondent talk about the unpaid housework of women and its contribution to Northern Ireland? Never. Um, it's a longer story, but when the GDP concept was being developed in the 1930s, a deliberate ideological decision was made to exclude uh, the paid workers or the unpaid work of women. And it partly can be explained by that um, infamous or famous adage from John Maynard Keynes that when I marry my maid, GDP goes down. So what you had somebody doing work for you that you were paying them, but suddenly when you marry them, that the same work is going on, but now you don't pay them. And that you know raises this gender issue, but also the hidden elements of our economy that the GDP concept doesn't communicate. Voluntary activity, this is an example of a community garden, doesn't get included in GDP. And yet, and yet, politicians and ourselves probably on this call will see these as good things. We like volunteering, it's good, it helps with social cohesion, it's good for mental health, it's good for connection, and so on. Yet, it doesn't get included in our titular objective and measurement of the progress in our society, GDP. And indeed, the work that goes on in our democracy, and many of us are proud that we live in democracies, although in my view, we're, it's an unfinished democracy. We still haven't come to the end of our democratic journey, and certainly we need a reinvigoration of that. But democracy is not included in our GDP concept. And a lovely, eloquent way of discussing this, sadly, this was a commencement address that Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's brother, gave about two weeks before, sadly, he too was assassinated. And you can read it there yourself in terms of his own criticism that he was looking at GNP, which is a slightly different technical measure. GDP becomes more um, common in the 1990s with globalization, but you can see it there. You know, this measurement of economic growth doesn't include the beauty of our poetry, our wit, our courage, our wisdom, our compassion. All these things that we would see adds to the quality of our lives, but doesn't actually get included in this dominant objective around which public policy businesses and indeed most citizens are orientated towards and this is nothing new this is back in 1968 so we've known about this for quite some time so why do we have this almost um addiction structural connection with the need to have more gdp so diff what I mean by undifferentiated is GDP does not determine between a divorce producing an increase in GDP and something more positive. So why does it still dominate our economic thinking and indeed our common sense view about the economy? I would say from the bar room to the boardroom, most people have a rather vague commitment that growth is good, 
but actually don't really know why. Uh, and I think that's very dangerous because I think that allows, you know, this myth and this very risky idea that somehow we can have infinite growth and that our economies need growth. Uh, I think growth is needed in other parts of the world, but I certainly don't think where it's needed in advanced, overdeveloped countries such as Ireland and Britain and certainly North America. And this has been a long tradition, although a rather small one within uh, the academy and the policy world, because as Jackson says here, you know, questioning growth is seen as an act of lunatics, idealists and revolutionaries guilty on all three counts. And in a way, it's because growth has become part of what we're loyal to in a, in a neoliberal, globalizing, capitalist, consumer orientated, entrepreneur promoting economy, all of which I'm not necessarily saying are always bad, but it is about it saying that part of the beauty of, of events like this, and I do welcome Dennis's opportunity to share with you, that we need to discuss this. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations around what does a business model look like that perhaps accepts a post-growth macroeconomic analysis? Uh, what should we say to Paul Frew, our new minister for the economy, about these issues that I'm going to present to you today? So it's funny that his new, um, you know, 10x uh, economic model has come out all around growth uh, on the very same day that I'm talking to you today. Some of you may recall, I don't know how old many people are in the audience, but back in 1972 was the kind of original limits to growth analysis that was then followed by a whole variety of academic and public policy analysis right up until today. Uh, perhaps Tim Jackson, along with Kate Rayworth, are probably the two most prominent and very articulate and very eloquent uh, defenders of the need for us to start thinking beyond economic growth. So we have lots of evidence, social science evidence, in terms of this, this juncture between human flourishing and more economic growth and consumption, the biophysical evidence from climate science and ecological science that uh, you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet, and yet, and yet, we still cling to economic growth, almost like an article of faith. And what this leads then to our contemporary debate about greening growth, which is based on decoupling production. Uh, we can use technology, and certainly we need to do this, about moving to a more resource efficient and low carbon economy. Or to put it more provocatively, this is, in my view, greening the Hummer, or biofueling the Hummer. And you could say that's better than a non biofuel fossil fuel Hummer, but maybe the Hummer is the problem. Maybe the structure of the economy, a growing economy, is the problem that we need to really look at and not necessarily the resources and fuel that goes into it. And I think this is where we get into why growth has become so sticky as a concept. I would, I would say it's mythic. And I think it's linked in my own work back to uh, our one analogous um, myth we have in Western political and cultural history is Achilles' lance. This was a, a weapon that could heal the wounds it inflicts. And I think that's our dominant view in society, in politics and business, in the academy, it has to be said as well, that somehow more growth, which can cause problems, but we grow and then use the uh, you know, extra resources to clean and fix as we, as we move along. I think this is also a link to another mythic notion of Prometheus, that Promethean urge that we can continually, you know, dominate the planet, you know, master in that misogynistic way in which all of that communicates, that we can use technological innovation to decouple from all of this, that technology will solve us. This is what I would call a plug and play version of the future. That we don't, don't need to change anything really with the structure of our economy. We can continue with globalization, competitiveness, FDI, and so on. All we've got to do is have more, uh, use less resources, and have a low carbon transition. And I think there are serious problems with this. You know, part of it is that we have not seen the levels of technological innovation decoupling ever, you know, um, and this is really, really worrying. We're kind of betting that these technologies will come about to enable us to live in this dematerialized, you know, low carbon world. And I think there's often the assumption or indeed the hope, and I'll give you an example, which is very worrying to me, which came out last week from the International Energy agency that we have new technologies that have yet to be invented like carbon capture and sequestration at scale or some really in my view science fiction technological innovations like solar radiation management the kind of earth systems science that we can manage the you know the atmosphere in, in some ways which i think are extremely risky uh, and in which to bet the longevity and the sustainability of the human enterprise 
So this came out um, last week from the IEA, it's net zero uh, by 2050 roadmap. And at least it was honest enough to admit that half of the reductions that it's, that it's modeling is assuming are from technologies currently at the demonstration phase. In other words, not at scale, they haven't been proven, and yet we're betting that these technologies, I mean, to me, that is mythic thinking. It's wish fulfillment and risky, when actually, why not say, we have all the technologies we need, all we need to do is change the structure of our economy, you know, reduce our consumption, you know, talk about more redistribution, you know, tackling social inequalities directly through redistributive measures rather than trickle-down measures, which, of course, is a major way in which to promote economic growth. And so, therefore, I'm raising questions about limits of decoupling, and we can see some examples of it empirically, but there's no sign of absolute decoupling of the overall economy. Just to let you know that since the, the movie An Inconvenient Truth, you know, the famous Al Gore climate change film, a third of all carbon emissions ever emitted by the human enterprise in our history has been emitted since that film. That, to me, is an example of the limits of decoupling. We've seen decoupling in small areas, but we've not seen the overall scale of the human economy, either at a planetary level, or indeed there's no example at the national level of, of an economy decoupling at that scale. And indeed, where we do see limits or decoupling, it's often outsourcing. So all the dirty production has taken place in the Philippines and China, so it's off the books in Britain and Ireland and other European countries. There's also the problem that decoupling doesn't deal because it's focusing on production. It doesn't deal with what's called the rebound effect or uh, what we call in the academy the Jeevan's paradox, that where the efficiency gains uh, are actually uh, outweighed then by an increase in uh, you know, consumption. The example, of course, is cars. Cars are measurably more resource and fuel efficient than they were 40 years ago. But yes, car emissions are increasing. And the reasons we own more cars and we're traveling more by car. In other words, we've got to directly start addressing consumption and not just put all our eggs in the basket, as it were, on decarbonizing and decoupling production. Or to put it another way, when our electricity bills are cheaper because of perhaps a transition to green energy, all of the changes and the savings of decarbonizing could be affected if we don't reduce our overall use. Or in fact, if, we, if we're using our savings and spending less on energy, and we start spending on flights, for example. In other words, these are very difficult political issues that we have to be honest about them, that simply going for technological efficiency itself is necessary, but radically insufficient for what it is that we need to do as we go forward in the century. And therefore, why not start looking at decarbonizing our economy and moving to a post-growth paradigm by design, not disaster? And this is the science I use here to back me up is that most of the climate change modeling uh, is very clear that we cannot have a commitment to the Paris Agreement, which is the 2015 International Agreement on Climate Change, which holds that countries should keep the overall average temperature of the Earth at 1.5 and definitely below 2 degrees. We're already at just north of 1 degree, folks, just you know, for your interest. We, that is incompatible with a growing economy. And usually in a capitalist economy, it's about 3 to 4% a year, which means the economy more than doubles every 20 odd years or so. And that's the scale of the issue. So the quote here from Anderson and Bow is quite significant, although I would quibble with that word austerity, which I have some ideological problems with. But I do think that what they're getting at is that our economies in the global north need to go on a carbon diet, need to consider moving beyond growth, particularly to keep within the Paris Agreement limits, but also to enable China, Asia, Africa, and so on, to grow their economies and to take their people out of poverty. And it's interesting that we've only ever seen massive reductions in um, carbon emissions with an economic recession or a major upheaval. Even the pandemic that we've experienced over the last year has only had modest increase, or sorry, modest impacts in, on the downward side on overall carbon emissions, although at local levels, Belfast, London, and so on, have immeasurably improved air quality over much of the lockdown as people weren't driving. So the science is pretty clear. This is a, an example of a letter I actually signed myself along with 15,000 other um, social scientists and scientists about a, a, a warning of a climate emergency. And what we've said in that letter is we need to shift beyond GDP growth and the pursuit of affluence to sustaining ecosystems and, and focusing on human well-being 
and particularly about reducing inequality. So therefore, why don't we have another version of decoupling, which I'll invite you to consider, particularly in the context of the tech space and the digital transformation, focus on innovation, not to improve and maximize the ecological efficiency of production, but the ecological efficiency of human flourishing, which I think, I'll just throw it out there, I can talk about more at some other point. Um, we need to also you know, look at recomposing consumption and perhaps reducing consumption. And indeed, what if a future you know, sustainable economy, it's not just a low carbon economy, but actually a low energy economy, where we're using less energy as opposed to the assumption of using more or the same. And so I do think, just to begin to conclude, that we do need to seriously start questioning in our societies, in the global north, in the minority world, at the macro level, so again, it's at that macro, that remember that donut idea, it's at that macro level, what does that mean then for particular sectors in the economy? And I do think we're facing a problem of lock-in. You know, there's a very common problem with our fossil fuel lock-in in our economy. It's very difficult and it's taking a long time to you know, unlock our carbon energy system. Uh, and the reason for that is quite simple, is that almost every system in society, from how we move to how we grow, to how we heat our homes, the electricity, is largely based on fossil fuels. And if you don't believe that, ask yourself this question. Can you name one thing in the room that you're sitting in that isn't made in whole or part or transported in whole or part without the use of fossil fuels. And I think in a similar way, we're addicted at the moment in a temporary way, I hope, to economic growth. And therefore, like any addiction, and I'm being provocative here just for effect, we need a phased detox and a plan to move beyond both carbon and indeed both beyond growth. And perhaps greening growth discourse, clean growth is one step in the right direction, but it can't be the terminus of our journey. And I think we have to acknowledge that there is a problem, that a growing economy is incompatible with the biophysical realities of life on this earth. It's also not actually increasing human flourishing beyond a certain point. And indeed, ask ourselves that question, why is it easier to imagine an apocalyptic future than to imagine the end of growth? And that, in a way, gets towards how growth has almost like wormed its way into this mythic idea that's part of the common sense of our understanding of the economy. You know, after all, the stone age didn't end with a lack of stones. So why should economic growth end simply because we, we've recognized that it's no longer possible? It, you know, we can continue growing our economies, but it's going to be at increasing negative and suboptimal outcomes and so on. And I do think we have to start distinguishing what types of growth we want in the economy, which sectors of our economy we want to grow, and which do we want to decline. For example, the fossil fuel and affiliated sectors they are simply incompatible to continue in the years ahead. But then why don't we start thinking, well, what other things can we do with oil beyond burning it for electricity or energy use? And indeed, we have to start thinking of maybe having our economic minister, Paul Frew, and I'm sure there's some colleagues, I'd be happy to volunteer myself. What if our economic system was designed with people with scientific backgrounds? People who you know, understood the biophysical realities of life on Earth, because sadly, neoclassical economics, which is the dominant understanding of economics that abounds in business and public policy is ecologically ignorant, if not to say ecologically irrational. And so the key, the key take home message is that we need to start thinking beyond orthodox, undifferentiated economic growth. We need to see economic growth as a means, not an end in itself. And so it's not a rejection of economic growth uh, in, in terms of poverty or economic, or economic growth at a time. But just as growth does not continue forever in any organic system or organism, we have to start thinking that we come to a point where we have to plateau out and have to get to a steady state version of our economic system. And we need to actually begin to move beyond the Promethean, this idea that technological prowess can enable us to grow forever, to what I would call a more proportionary attitude to economic growth. And I think Wilkinson and Pickett, again, up there with Tim Jackson and Kate Rayworth, definitely people worth um, uh, reading, I think put it very eloquently. And again, it's the issue of directing this issue to the overdeveloped world, the minority world. And the bit of underlying, perhaps the most important, the populations of rich countries where most of us here on this call live, we've come to the end of a long historical journey. So thank you for listening. And let's have the courage of our convictions and take up with gusto what George Bernard Shaw here says in terms of 
progress depending upon being unreasonable. So let's be unreasonable and based on science. And thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Uh, um, I'm not going to, I'm sort of slightly got my jaw on the desk <laughs> from that tour de force. But what a start to our afternoon. I'm sure lots and lots of people are going to go away and watch this talk again and share it with people they know, because I've, I've personally never heard that that sort of proposition put uh, quite so compellingly. So uh, thank you for starting our, our session off. Uh, we must move on, John. So apologies, uh, apologies for that. So our second talk, what a great start. So our second talk is Understanding Today for a Healthier Tomorrow. Uh, we're going to hear from two speakers about the Northern Ireland cohort of longitudinal study of ageing. I think Dennis probably did that better than I did. Or Nicola, as it's known, the first large-scale study of ageing in Northern Ireland. Our first speaker is Dr. Charlotte Neville, Senior Research Fellow at Queen's University Belfast. Uh, and we'll talk about the Northern Ireland cohort of Nicola. Um, and she, uh, after she's spoken, we'll then hear from Paul Moorhead. Uh, but to start with, let's have Charlotte Neville join me on stage. Charlotte, if you can come and join me. Looking forward to hearing about this. Charlotte, well done. Um, I'll let you get your slides sorted out and uh, I'll come off the stage. Are you ready to go? Yes, just nearly there. Let us see if we can get them. Brilliant, well done. Okay. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. Thank you, Dennis, for the, the kind introduction. So yes, my name is Charlotte Neville. I'm the, a senior research fellow at Queen's University. So it is quite a mouthful. So that's why we shorten it to Nicola for the Northern Ireland cohort for the longitudinal study of aging. So my talk is this afternoon is addressing this grand challenge of our aging society. And there are many challenging issues facing society and our economy. But the one that affects virtually every aspect of life is the fact that we're living longer. Our population is aging. And the most dramatic change in our population is in the 65 plus age group. And um, by 2050, it's estimated that a third of our population will be aged over 65 years. And even if we look further at the 85 plus age group, it's predicted that they will almost double over the next 25 years. So it is this life in expectancy increasing and also our declining birth rate that is bringing this change in our society. But if we compare Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK, we can see that Northern Ireland is projected to have the largest increase in the pension age population in the UK. And this is quite dramatic for Northern Ireland. Between 2018 and 2014, or 2043 rather, um, Northern Ireland is projected to have a 41% increase in the pension age population. And that's in comparison to England, 31%, Scotland, 23%, and Wales, 19%. So you can see how our ageing society is impacting on the province. On average, 18% of people in North, each council area of Northern Ireland are aged over 65 years. And it is estimated that in today's generation, one in three children born today will reach their 100th birthday. So while this trend is good news, ultimately having nearly half of the population over 50 years of age within the next 30 years is going to pose many societal and policy channel challenges and really the speed at which our population is aging means that we can't we simply can't look to our own grandparents experience of how they coped with retirement and how we can use that for our own retirement so things do have to change for example you know we need to look at how can we best maintain and maximize independence and the health and well-being of older people and um, how do we organize and fund the delivery of care services for older people and then also making adequate pension provision and then ultimately what are the consequences 
for the labour market um, and employment with an increasing population of people who are reaching the conventional retirement age. But we also need to remember that this trajectory of ageing, it's a changing trajectory and while many people will enjoy later life and will sail through their later years in a happy and um, happy way, there are also many that are faced with very many challenges as they get older in terms of whether it be ill health or loneliness and um, also financial worries, mental health issues, um, even things like nutrition and then also this whole network and social participation. So all these factors play a key role on how we all experience aging. So which moves me on to what is Nicola and to give you an idea for those who have never heard of Nicola. It's a vital resource for moving forward with science and policy within Northern Ireland. It's the Northern Ireland cohort for the longitudinal study of ageing and it was really developed in response to this global challenge that we need to promote this active, active healthy ageing and that the government need to grasp this. So Nicola was developed as Northern Ireland's first large scale longitudinal study of ageing. So we have a random sample of approximately eight and a half thousand men and women all aged 50 plus from across the um, widespread across Northern Ireland. And really Nicola was designed with a goal in place was to give people of Northern Ireland a voice. It allows us to explore different factors, how social factors, how economic factors and biological factors are changing the lives of older people. And because it's a longitudinal study, we can look at this trajectory of aging and how different people follow different trajectories as they get older. So we carry out interviews every two to three years and we carry out a health assessment every four to five years. But as I said, it provides this scientific evidence base on what it's like to be getting older in Northern Ireland. And of course, in Northern Ireland, we have the unique focus of the troubles. And we're looking at this in terms of how the troubles have impacted on people's mental health, their psychological well-being, um, and things like post-traumatic stress and things like that. We have a nutrition side, so we're a strong focus on lifestyle issues, nutrition, physical activity, and then other things like eye health, cognitive health. We do a lot of measures in that. And importantly, for Nicola, and to allow us to compare our work with other countries, we, our methods are strongly harmonized with other aging cohort studies. So we have TILDA in the South, we have the English Longitudinal Study of Aging in England, and then the Health and Retirement Study in the US. All of our results, we can compare them against what other countries are showing. And our motto and the title of this talk was Understanding Today for a Healthier Tomorrow. So that is the ultimate aim of Nicola. To give you an overview of Nicola, we have two waves of data collection that have taken place so far. So wave one ended in 2016. When it, it was comprised of the computer assisted personal interview in the eight and a half thousand participants. They also completed a self completion questionnaire this allowed us to gather more information on more sensitive issues such as the troubles and things like that. We had we carried out a clinical health assessment and then also we had a strong um, dietary component. We did a detailed dietary analysis on them. And currently we're working on wave two, the cleaning of this data. So this was our repeat survey, which followed up the same set of participants and we repeated the same type of computer assisted personal interview along with the self completion questionnaire. And then of course we have the impact of COVID. So recently we administered over just under five and a half thousand COVID questionnaires to all our participants. And this is really to allow us to compare pre COVID issues affecting aging with how then COVID has impacted on the health and well-being of older adults. And then looking forward, we're hoping to carry out a wave three as part of Nicola. 
But in the next few slides, I wanted to just highlight some of the key issues that are facing older people in Northern Ireland today. Um, and what we're noticing is an increasing number of older adults with long term disability and chronic conditions. In fact, over one third of older adults in the Nicola cohort alone reported having a limiting long term illness and that increased with age. Mental health, however, um, we reported just over half reported good or excellent mental health. But when we broke this down, there was a higher prevalence of poor mental health in the 50 to 64 year old age group compared to the older age groups and also in the lower socioeconomic groups. In terms of falls, so we're looking, doing a lot of research into frailty. 18% um, of older adults reported falling one to five times in the past year. In terms of then, we looked at other factors. So marital status is one thing we look at. So those who were married or cohabiting reported had better self-reported health than those who were single. So as I said, living alone associated with poorer reported health outcomes than those living with others. And we also noticed that those living in the more populated areas, so Belfast or the bigger town areas, reported poorer health compared to those in rural areas. Moving on to then the use of healthcare services. So we notice a large majority of older adults have visited their GP at least once in the past year. And that's probably what we would expect for this age group. Um, but when we looked again, the cluster analysis of who was reporting the highest use of these services. So we're again, we're finding those who reported had poor self-reported health used the GP services more often. Those who had difficulties with activities of daily living or had a long-term illness, again, greater use of GP services. But other things we're, we're picking out is that those who live alone tend to visit their GP more, tend to use emergency departments more. Those who live in socially deprived areas. And then one of the key issues that we're seeing is this experience of loneliness. So we're seeing a relationship between loneliness and increased use of visits to the GP. And really, I want to focus in on this a wee bit more. And it's all about the importance of social connectivity, our environment, our social environment, our relationships with others. And this connection is increasingly crucial for our health and well-being as we get older. And I'm thinking more, we have the micro level of high connectivity is important for yes our health and well-being but also at the more macro level it's important for our, our economy and society as a whole and this is where a lot of our policy and research interest is looking towards at the minute this thing of social isolation and loneliness in older adults and there has been a great interest in this these are two different concepts but they're often used um together okay so social isolation is an objective concept and refers to the lack of relationships with others loneliness on the other hand is more subjective concept and refers to unwelcome feelings about lack of contact so you could have somebody who is socially isolated but not necessarily feeling lonely and on the other hand you could have somebody who's feeling lonely but isn't socially isolated so, and we know that loneliness and social isolation can be caused by many factors, whether it be individual, social or structural. And it's the transitions in life as a person gets older also poses greater risk of loneliness. So things like retirement, bereavement, disability, and even sensory loss can lead to greater risk of loneliness. But when we look further at this, if we look at social connectedness and engagement of, of older people, we know it's in, increasingly crucial for people to interact socially and participate in society. And in the Nicola cohort, um, living alone, one in four older adults live alone. And this rises to about 50% in the older population. It was twice as common, we find, in the more deprived areas versus the least deprived areas and three times as common in our more populated areas 
versus our rural areas. Social connectedness was quite good. More than three quarters talk weekly by phone to their relatives or friends, which is very encouraging. But we also noted that the friendship circle decreases with age. And, you know, out of, out of all of the cohort that we surveyed, 18% reported that they don't have any close friends. So this is somebody who they could talk to or rely on for support or, you know, just have a, a personal discussion with. In terms of isolation and this lack of companionship, it was least likely among the 65 to 74 year old age group. And this feeling of being left out tended to decrease with age. But then we also have to think, you know, as you get older, do your expectations change? You know, do you feel more comfortable in yourself and, you know, not needing this social connectivity or having the feeling of being left out? And then men were less likely to feel socially isolated or lacking companionship compared to women. But then there's also a thought, are men less likely possibly to report such feelings, you know, when they're asked about it? In terms of social engagement then, um, just over a third reported that they were involved in activity, activity groups. So this is like sports groups, religious groups and 18% were involved in voluntary activity. And social engagement tended to be higher in those who were married, those with higher education and from the least deprived areas. So you can see these pockets of society um, that influence social engagement. Religion was a very strong feature in, in older adults. Religion, three quarters reported religion as being very or somewhat important in their lives. And it is a good source of social engagement and connectivity. Um, however, 45% reported that they did not participate in any social engagement activities. Moving on and looking at the other side of the scale. So I've talked about social isolation and this connectivity. But if we think of the other side of things, the loneliness aspect. And what we're seeing in older people is that 18% reported that they experienced loneliness. And how we addressed loneliness was we measured it in a scaled response to five different questions. So we asked them how often they felt uh, lacked companionship how often they felt left out, isolated, how often they felt lonely. So those were merged together to create this um, combined analysis of loneliness. Loneliness we found was higher among the 50 to 64 year old age group compared to the older age groups that we surveyed. And in terms of different so, um, pockets of older adults, we see loneliness was higher amongst those living alone. It was higher in those who were permanently sick versus those who were, were retired or currently working. And it was higher in those who had poor self-reported health and in the most deprived areas. So really what I'm trying to get across in the, the key messages from this talk, and I, I'm only touching, I've only really touched on one area that is coming to the fore in Nicola. There are many different aging trajectories, as I said, and what we're seeing in the Nicola study is there's a lot of change in our family structures um, throughout Northern Ireland. This was evident through patterns of care, friendship and intergenerational solidarity is what we, we, we would term them. We're seeing a lot of a sandwich generation coming through where older people are caring for an older parent, but they also have children of their own. So they're in, in the middle of this sandwich, so to speak. We're also seeing, as I said, patterns of social isolation and loneliness are depend on gender. It depends on age, income, health and social circumstances. But what is important is this connectivity. It's important that we need to increase connectivity in older adults but it does need to be considered in a holistic way that looks at physical mobility. It considers transport, the environment around us, and this physical virtual intersection. 
And ultimately, it's the design of the built environment around us that enables older people to access neighborhoods and their surrounding areas. And by doing this, we can increase activity, increase connectivity and improve, ultimately improve the health and quality of life of older people. And by technology, it provides us with this um, support mechanism. It can play an increasing role in providing the support that people need. And it can address some of the challenges that face older people in connecting with others. And just to finalize, it's important that we use innovation. Innovation is how we move forward with technology to meet the needs of an aging society. The next slide is just, I'm just touching on what we're doing next in terms of research in the Nicola cohort. Um, we have just recently been funded to do what's called our space project. It's supportive environments for physical and social activity, healthy and aging and cognitive health. Because we have this knowledge that where we live also influences our brain health and our risk of cognitive impairment. For example, poor air quality, particularly in towns and cities, is known to lead to a decline in brain health. So some of the questions that we're looking at at the minute, are there specific factors that interact to make our environment a problem for brain health? And how can we address this? What are the best policies, interventions that we can use to promote healthy aging and brain health, especially for our poorest communities? So sure. how we're doing this is we're, we're collecting physical activity data from our participants and analyzing this to get a sense. And it's all about this urban design, designing our environment, looking at the interaction with our lifestyle behaviors and how it impacts on our mental health, brain health and cardiometabolic health. And ultimately with the aim of improving cognitive health. So it's, 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 all about this connectivity and urban design and the environment around us. We must bring this. Thanks so much, okay. uh, Charlotte. Thanks very it's, much. It, Lovely it's such an important topic, um, and it's so good to get really strong data on loneliness. And I'm sure the last 12 months, I mean, everyone's now aware of it. I mean, the government, all the governments have kind of been running programs on it. So uh, it's incredibly Absolutely. important stuff. Um, we must we must move on to our second speaker on this topic. So Charlotte, thank you so much for telling us about Nicola and giving us the latest uh, data. Uh, and now uh, we're going to hear from Paul Moorhead, founder of Cradle, uh, who are a Belfast based age tech company who develop new technologies that help people remain independent for longer. So sort of tackling this important area. Uh, Paul CV, at least the one I wish uh, I had shared with me, says that he's worked in tech for over 30 years. He's quite tired now and would like a rest. But we can't let you rest yet, Paul. We must get you on the stage um, and hear what you are doing at Cradle. So please come up and join me. The, f the floor is yours, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a big thank you to Dennis and the, the team at Aneco for inviting me to come along. Um, I'm going to dive in and go quickly because I'm between you and, and coffee and possibly a bio break. Um, before we talk about Cradle specifically, let's talk about what we mean by healthy aging and the healthy aging challenge. This is obviously about more than just staying alive. Um, the way we think about it at Cradle is uh, onto this broader concept of resilience. And resilience has many components. Um, physical health, being active, free from pain, managing the physical decline of age well. Mental health, freedom from anxiety and depression. Social health, and Charlotte talked there at length about this, it's a big issue. Being part of a community, being free from loneliness. Loneliness is a disease uh, and we have an epidemic of it on our hands. Um, spiritual health, this is about having a sense of purpose and self-worth. Uh, it may involve religion, uh, but it may be about hobbies, interests, families. Um, financial health, being free from concerns about being able to afford the things you need, particularly perhaps care. Uh, and safety and security, living in an environment without risks. And uh, Charlotte referred to falls, which unfortunately are so often the beginning of a, of a steep downward trend for, for elderly people. Um, and these are all areas where uh, technology can measure uh, directly in some cases, otherwise indirectly, uh, these factors. 
But more importantly, these are all areas that can be improved through technology. Um, and this is where I think the whole concept of, of age tech comes to, to life under this heading of resilience. Um, it's a very complicated space at the moment, age tech, and it's, um, it's evolving fast. Here's the, uh, the graphic from the Geron Technologist, which is a very good site if you'd like to have a look. If I put up the chart from five years ago, there'd have been maybe a couple of dozen companies on it. And now it is so crowded and getting more crowded with every month that passes. It's a useful breakdown, I think, of the functional areas uh, covered by age tech, but I think it's rapidly becoming unhelpful in a different sense because what we're seeing now is a lot of convergence. It doesn't make sense to deploy multiple technologies, products and services within the homes of elderly people uh, to improve their lives. Single devices can actually cover a lot of these spaces. Um, while you maybe see Cradle is in the social and communication box there, you know, we think it belongs in, in wellness, in health, in independence uh, and other spaces. And in fact, the way we position Cradle is being um, focused on a convergence of TV centric social engagement, turning the TV into a social portal, um, but also then monitoring support uh, and telehealth. And we believe we're unique in occupying that space. The product itself is called Connect. It's a hub that connects to a TV over HDMI. It has camera and what have you in it, but also a bunch of sensors. The TV interface is super simple. It was uh, co-designed with um, a living lab that's part of Brighton University School of Nursing. So it, answer, it asks yes or no questions. The remote control has four buttons. Uh, it's very simple indeed to use. Uh, particularly importantly is a feature that we call TV Takeover. So we can use a combination of infrared and CEC, Consumers Electronics Control, which is part of the HDMI spec to control the TV. So we can turn it on and off, we can change inputs. So if there's an incoming video call, somebody presses a button, they can have the video call and then they can return to watching TV because elderly people typically do not understand the plumbing of their TV and their set top boxes. There's an app for smartphones and tablets. That's mostly about the social side of things, video calls, messaging, picture messaging, what have you. There's a web app, which is kind of our portal and dashboard for primary carers and clinicians where you can set reminders and do health data. And all of this sits on top of our uh, machine learning enabled monitoring platform, which integrates data from our sensors and from other third party sensors. What we're trying to do with it um, is a couple of things. Firstly, move from proactive care, sorry, reactive care towards proactive care. There are numerous studies that show that we can double the number of healthy years of life uh, for older adults um, if we go. Uh, proactive rather than reactive. And we can also have the cost of delivering that care, which is hugely important. So we're trying to reduce unnecessary hospital admissions, enable early discharge and support treatment of chronic conditions at home. Uh, we're also trying to eliminate the barriers of access to the digital world for those older adults who otherwise could not access it. Over 50% of people over the age of 75 have not used the internet and are not going to as things stand. Um, and tackle the social isolation we've talked about before. In terms of customer engagement, uh, this chart is a couple of months out of date, so it's actually slid um, to the left. Um, what's interesting about it from my point of view is, is not focusing on any particular individual customer. It's that so many of the people with whom we're now working are NHS. So three years ago, if I described a go-to-market strategy, it would have been domiciliary care, it would have been retirement homes, care homes, and the mass market. And that's because, uh, no offense to anybody from the NHS who might be listening, selling to the NHS is hard, long sales cycles, uh, challenging procurement processes, and you can invest a lot of time and money in a, in a pilot which is successful in terms of proving efficacy and cost effectiveness, but still not be able to finesse that into an actual sale. But COVID has stood things on its head and the appetite for innovation and the agility that we're now seeing uh, within primary and secondary care is, is quite extraordinary. So you know, lots of NHS boxes on that chart I would not have expected to see. I'm going to take one example of those, uh, Pennine Lung Service based in Oldham. Uh, what they wanted to do working with us um, starting about six months ago was to facilitate early discharge of patients on oxygen and then support them remotely at home where the risk of COVID is much lower. Um, hospital is or has been until relatively recently one of the best places to catch COVID people with lung disease, let's get them home, let's manage the conditions, be it acute or chronic there, and let's free up capacity for incoming patients. Number of challenges thrown up in working with them on this. Firstly, we have to add support for clinical devices, a pair of devices, pulse oximeters and thermometers. We have to match the four hour installation response time 
um, that Pennine Lung were already getting from their uh, their oxygen suppliers. So they could discharge somebody at four hours notice on the oxygen would turn up. We needed to be there with Cradle, needed to install it into private homes without having any control over what maker model of TV is going to be there, not knowing what the home setup is going to be. Is the TV on the wall, on the table? Is there, a, is there a spare electrical socket? Do they have Wi-Fi? Do they have cellular coverage? A lot of unknowns. Um, partner with the overloaded nurses. You know, they're doing a fantastic job, but they're stressed and they often don't have technical understanding that would allow them to plug in HDMI cables, help with Wi-Fi configuration. So we have to not rely on them for any of that. Uh, and we're working with elderly and often distressed patients. You know, these are people being discharged, really quite ill from hospital in an ambulance, delighted to get home, but there's all these people milling around, setting up the oxygen, explaining the medication to them, and then now trying to show them cradle and how to use it. Uh, and that's a lot uh, going on. And of course, integrating with the NHS teams, getting the right information from them, getting them the right information from us and doing it fast. So what happened? Um, well, as you can imagine, there was a lot of learning and adjusting in real time. It was really quite a, quite a challenge. We recruited uh, two part-time installers in Manchester because you can't get from Belfast to Manchester in four hours. Uh, worked closely with a brilliant project manager in the NHS at Salford to design the workflows, build a shared portal, to handle the data, address the privacy issues, and most importantly, set up those regular checkpoints to ensure it was all working. And we learned quickly from early mistakes. A lot of elderly people do not have LG, Samsung, Panasonic, or Sony TVs. They have cheaper TVs, and some of these are a nightmare to control. The infrared uh, commands are not available anywhere. They don't support CEC. Um, we learned quickly they're just sub TVs we shouldn't go near. We discovered that about 20% of users do know how to switch the input on their TV using the source button on the remote control, but that 20% is only one in five, so it's a small proportion. We learned that we shouldn't go near people who have significant cognitive impairment. It's confusing and scary to bring new technologies into the home of people with those problems, unless there's someone else there who can understand the product. It works much better if there's a family member who's going to take an active interest and will actively use Connect then to make video calls to their mother or father on a daily basis. Um, well, what's come out of this after six months is a very happy customer who has a pool of, it's actually gone up to 70 devices now, uh, in rotation. And the customer themselves have created an NHS case study showing how they've been able to avoid expensive ambulance rolls, which cost about £1,500 per, per go by working remotely with patients who have issues, assessing their health with an HD video call, looking at their pulse oximetry and what have you, um, with the data from the paired devices, and calm and reassure them. Moving on quickly then, um, I wanna go through some of the objections that get thrown up uh, with regard to Cradle and other uh, overlapping products. There's several common ones we've seen over the last couple of years. First one that comes up all the time is, hey, look, older adults are using FaceTime all the time. My dad uses it. Why don't we just give people a smartphone? Well, it is great that there are people that can use uh, tablets and smartphones. And of course, there should be uh, products that, that target people that can, but most of them can't. And if you've tried to, to work with elderly people and technology, you understand very quickly how stressful and scary it is for them. Nobody likes to feel stupid. If they don't get it, it just becomes a source of stress and unhappiness. We know the TV is a familiar, comfortable device. People are happy with it, and the adoption has been really pretty fantastic around the TV approach. So we know that works. Um, we get told that clinicians aren't going to embrace the new technologies. Well, uh, I think it's become clear with COVID, clinicians were never the obstacle to rolling out new technology within the NHS. Before COVID, less than 10% of GP surgeries offered video consultation. Today, 99% do. If the technology works, if it can fit within their work patterns and it's reliable, they will adopt it. Uh, and that's exactly what's what's happening. At number three, we shouldn't be using technology to replace the human touch. You know, this is just going to isolate people even more. I hear this a lot. Uh, this one makes me smile because what are the two most important things in the home of every older adult? They are already pieces of technology. Firstly, the TV, you know, it's there as a constant companion, educator and entertainer for elderly people, wouldn't be without it. Um, and if you've ever tried to visit my mom when Roger Federer was playing tennis, she'd realize how much less she valued your company than watching Roger Federer play tennis. And the other technology is the telephone. Uh, you know, who would live without it? But what would be better than a voice call um, to overcome loneliness and make people feel connected? A video call. 
Uh, if you want some confidence that a loved one is in good health, what's going to work better? A voice call or actually being able to see them in HD on the TV set. We have so many testimonials now around the tech and the difference that has made um, to, to families that are separated by, by geography and all the more so because of COVID. So these technologies will make life better. They are not going to prevent um, the human touch. They're going to add to it. And the last objection, you know, my mum or dad wouldn't want uh, a camera in their living room. Well, security and privacy, it is an issue. It needs to be addressed head on. The older adult has to get value from the system. You know, the video calls, the picture messaging, whatever it is, they have to think that's great. Otherwise, this is just some kind of surveillance from their point of view in their home. They can't be profiling and selling. There has to be fine granularity of control so that they know what they're getting from the system and what they're giving up to do it. Uh, physical lens cover we've discovered offers a layer of a level of reassurance that an LED wouldn't. And the communities have to be walled gardens to prevent unscrupulous salespeople or even just to deal with some of the um, the behavioral problems that, that you can see with, uh, with older adults in some cases. Yeah. I'm going to park it there. Thank you very much for your attention. If you want to follow up with me afterwards, uh, I'm sure our details are available. Thank you all. Brilliant, Paul. Uh, fantastic uh, product. Really interesting to see a practical example of, of tech for older people going into the home and also some of the challenges kind of which we're all aware of uh, and the kind of really practical issues of working with uh, NHS staff who are themselves sort of, you know, technically challenged uh, as well as the realities of, of uh, old people's sort of ability to use and comfort with using tech. So um, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Charlotte, as well, for, for starting us off with some facts and figures. Uh, from the Nicola research. Thank you before that for a sort of tour de force uh, of the future of our economy from John Barry. And of course, our welcome from Dennis. We're now going to have a 10 minute break. Um, and then we are back with Juliana Early, Colm Hayden and Sean McCauley. So uh, I'll bring us off stage and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Uh, do grab a coffee, glass of water, uh, but do come back. Cheers.